Hello, Federico. Hi. Hi. So, um, you guys probably all know him. Uh, he's the guy who asked all the questions in the previous days, but more seriously, he runs uh, Strumenta, a, a service company, consulting company around uh, language engineering, MPS, and other stuff. Uh, a, he also hosts the um, Thursday evening, well, except today. Today is no meeting. Uh, usually the, the weekly language engineering meeting in his uh, Strumenta community. And um, as, as Alex mentioned, he was involved in the SIGI project, as we like to call it. And as part of that project, uh, Sergey, uh, sorry, Federico, you developed some kind of web uh, editing toolkit. Yes, that's Which actually. you're going to talk about now. Good. All right. Okay. So uh, thank you for the introduction and congratulations to Alex for his presentation. It was very interesting. Even if I was involved in the project, I learned a few things and uh, I really liked that presentation. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, this experiment, experimental part of Siginova that is trying to basically bring the editor to a scene to the browser. And this work is, of course, done with Ziggy. And in particular, in these uh, web editor parts, we got the help uh, of a bunch of people at Ziggy. And uh, Alessio also helped uh, me instrumenta. And uh, Sergey, and in general, it's always great to have Sergey involved in an MPS project, especially in this case in which we needed to understand some of the MPS internals and uh, I guess he's the only guy with that kind of expertise. Now, Alex already very well explained the example. I'm just doing a, saying a couple of things of the project for the people that connect late or will watch these later on YouTube. And uh, yes, once upon the time, uh, we... Um, uh, Ziggy decided to build this DSL to create business application for the public administration of Luxembourg. So we met, uh, I flew there in September 2018. We have a few meetings and very soon uh, we were joined by Markus Volter and Sergei Koshev. And uh, so we built this DSL. I think I need to update this number because I knew that 20 business analysts were using this DSL, but uh, if I recall, I recall correctly, Alex said that now there are 40, 50 person using that. So apparently the number is growing. And as he said, the application are defined in MPS, but then deployed and executed into a web portal where the public servants actually use them. And uh, he explained the DSL uh, in much detail. So, uh, you can refer to his presentation just to give you a quick idea of how the, the main concept looks like, the activity concept. You define basically uh, the kind of information that is acquired at each step, how we process it, and how we navigate to the following steps. So, uh, there are these languages to define business application. Okay, if these uh, MPS editors are so great, why deciding to build a web editor? And uh, I think there are three main reasons or set of reasons. There are a uh, group around the installation problem, usability problem, and integration problem. Now, the first thing is installation. As also Alex already said, we built an RCP version of MPS. That means basically a personalized uh, package, uh, package version of MPS with, you know, your nice splash screen. You remove the part of the menus that are confusing, just useful to people that create the language, but not to people that use them. You maybe remove some complex project panels and you give this uh, application to the user. Now, uh, we have uh, um, a plugin repository. So when we modify the language, we can uh, basically publish this new version of the plugin and the user can install the new version for the system. But it works until you need to upgrade the version of MPS you're using. In that case, 
well, you need to go uninstall the old version and install the new version. And this is why, for example, at this moment, we are using version 2019.3 because we don't want to go and install it on all the machines of the user. Also, as developers, we tend to forget that our users sometimes don't have admin privilege uh, to, on their machines. So, for example, at some point, we needed to install graphics and uh, we needed to ensure this was on the path, but normally users do not have the permission to do that. So you need to, to call someone from the IT that does that for you. It's not exactly great. It's an effort and we would like to avoid that. Then there is the point of usability. Uh, we are used to simple web application that seems very approachable. You just use drag and drop and uh, you start using them very easily. You don't have the same feeling the first time you open MPS. And I think Marcus also said something around this topic that the feedback we are getting is that user are reasonably okay with the language and the editor itself is what is around the editor that is confusing. The, what I mean, this shell is confusing. All the bunch of menus, all the panels, uh, the project views, and you know, there is just too much stuff, I would say. In a way, if you think about that, uh, MPS is trying to serve two different masters who have very different needs because MPS is used by language engineers. We are very hardcore developers and they like to use this tool that looks like an ID because uh, if I'm not wrong, MPS is based on the IDEA platform. That is the platform powering these amazing IDs from JetBrains, uh, but well, IDs are tools for developer by nature. And uh, so for the same tool to be used by language engineer and language user means uh, accepting some compromises. And finally, there is the point of integration. And here I mean integration in a very broad sense because I mean integration with the web team. Ziggy has web developers that can work on web application and we could leverage their skills to build the editors if they were built with uh, web technologies. I think you, you saw the portal in the previous presentation. Have you seen that? Well, it's very nice and it's better than what I could build. Uh, so it's better than what typical language engineer could build. So if we can reuse the skills the Ziggy has, I think it will be an advantage. Then integration with the portal. Uh, so right now, basically activities are defined into MPS, then you export an XML and the XML is deployed in a web portal where people use the final application. It would be nice to have a single environment where business analysts can write their applications and then try them out immediately in, in the browser. And finally, there is uh, the integration of a permission system. And I think this is some problem that different user uh, report that basically they would like to have a different group of users that belongs to different teams and some teams are able to read some stuff and to edit some other stuff. While having this kind of control in MPS is very hard. At the moment, uh, uh, analysts are organizing competence centers. So they divide activities into different Git repositories, but it's not exactly easy. If we build some web editor, we could uh, include uh, these controls more easily. And then uh, there was some comments from um, an analyst working at SIGI. And basically the idea was that uh, at the moment they are using some external tool for the first uh, brainstorming phase, the, the one in which they try to model the kind of uh, overall system they need. And later when they are ready to formalize, in, formalize things, they jump into 
MPS and define the single activities. It would be nice to have a single system that is more flexible, that can be used more for the less formal, more brainstorm activities, for which they currently use a tool like Visual Parading, and for the more formal stuff that is currently done in MPS. What we are aiming to do, and this is a challenge, so uh, we will see if we can solve this, uh, achieve this, but it's trying to combine the approachability of a drag and drop tool of something very simple as blocky with the productivity that we have uh, with the editors that we built uh, in MPS. So kind of a challenge. How does this work? Well, we basically have uh, MPS server, which is a plugin for MPS that we typically run headless, unless we are just experimenting. And uh, this basically communicates with uh, editors written using WebEdit Kit, which is a TypeScript framework, and that you communicate using HTTP and WebSockets. Now, what uh, how does MPS server work? Basically, it can handle requests regarding the models, like uh, give me all the, the nodes of a certain concept or the meta model. So for example, I can ask uh, what kind of properties this concept has on errors. So I can get the errors associated to a certain node on the type system. I can calculate the type of a certain node intention, I can get the list of intention and trigger them. So in other words, we the goal with MPS server is providing remote access to all the internal API of MPS. So in principle, it's very simple. Now, uh, this is a short demo that I recorded. Uh, so I call Zoom on things. Basically, what I'm trying to do is to show uh, on one side, MPS, I'm starting MPS server from within MPS, just clicking on a button because it's easier for test. And then on the other side, I have uh, Postman open where I can do request. For example, I can ask the list of routes which are available on a certain model. I send a get request and I get this list. I could also do this request through WebSocket, but for a demo, HTTP connection are easier. Now I look into the request for a particular node that I know is called Offre. There are a couple because this is a sandbox with all sorts of stuff. And I look at the IDE of that node, I note them, and I could later use it to do another request that is give me the name of this ID. Now I'm getting the name, but I could ask any property of this node. So I get the name is Offre. And uh, yeah, I can see this object name Offre open on the other side. And now I do a put to change the name of the object. And uh, of course, this is change in MPS. So this is uh, not particularly exciting, but this is a simple way which we can see that we can read information available in MPS and we can actually change it. Now, how do you start MPS server? You can start it from within the MPS ID itself as we have seen before, there is basically a panel, you go click a button and it start. In practice, you want to run it on a server from MPS headless. And that would be very simple. There is a Gradle plugin for that. The only problem is that you will also need to build your languages. And for that, you need a build configuration. And in general, this is a pain, but this is something you need to do to use uh, MPS server. Now, MPS server provide access to all the MPS API remotely. And then there is on the client side, this framework, WebEdit Kit, uh, it's a TypeScript framework that basically um, just talk with MPS server. So at a very high level, what does it do? You simply ask information to MPS server, like, hey, please tell me the name 
of this node and then it show you in the browser then it react to changes to mps server if more user uh, are connected to the same MPS server and they do changes, they are propagated to all users. So you could see that someone else changed the name and you update the view in the browser or they uh, record changes done by the user and send it to the server. So very simple design. And we have another very quick demo in which I basically have MPS open and the and a web editor built with web edit kit and basically guess what if i edit from somewhere i see on the other side and i can edit properties and i can select uh, references so uh, not exacting i mean hopefully it's not surprising this is the kind of basic stuff that you would like to do in a web editor that try to replicate some of the functionality of MPS. Now, just to give you an idea, uh, to build the editor that you see in this uh, white screenshot, you have to write the code that you see in the black screenshot. So it should give you an idea of the kind of complexity that you are facing. Now, if we go more in details, we can see that the first line where there is the title activity that I cannot change and uh, an edit box where I can actually type the name of the activity, I can see that uh, I obtain this result by typing in TypeScript, well, using the function row because we are defining a row. Then inside this row, we have a constant uh, with the text activity. And I specify a CSS class page title that just uh, we use just to make the font bigger. And then we want to edit a property. In reality, we want to say, take the child label of this node and take the text property of the child and let me edit that. And I want also that to be bigger. So I use the CSS class also for that. So very simple, but give you the idea that we use CSS to uh, define the style of this stuff. This line is even simpler because it's just one row with one constant, objet manipulé dans l'activité. And also in this case, I specify a CSS class. In this row, I specify a tab cell that I just use it to indent it. And uh, maybe you could get the same result by using CSS class and indent the next cell, but I did it in this way. And then what I use, I use a function that say, take the vars children. So I will have a containment uh, um, relation called vars. Take those children and show them uh, one below the others. Now, given there are no children, I'm showing a placeholder that you can use to add the first child. And then uh, we have something a bit different. Uh, we are showing uh, uh, this list of steps and we are instead defining directly a virtual node. We use Snapdom, which is this library to create virtual nodes uh, in the DOM. We say, I want to define a div, uh, I want to use uh, the CSS class area, and then I want to have uh, the collection of children in the steps uh, collection, and I want to wrap, add uh, an HTML ID to that collection so that later I can refer to it from TypeScript code and, or from CSS code. So. This is just an example to give you the idea that we have access to all the web stuff. So like CSS classes and IDs. Now we wanted to create web native editors, not an adaptation of MPS editors. Why this is the case? Because we wanted to give the look and feel of a web editor. Uh, we wanted web developer at Sigi to eventually take over. 
and we want that seamless integration with other web components so that we can reuse any web library that there is out there. Now, you may have noticed that we were using certain uh, methods from uh, a class called activity template uh, while defining our editor. If we were looking at the code of this class, we will see that uh, it has method like label that get the child in the property label and knows that is of type UI label. So it does a cast. A cast. Or we have method like bars vertical call that show a vertical collection with all the children in the containment bars. Or we have add news that we can add to create a new child in the collection news. Now, all this stuff is specific for our language. And we don't write that stuff manually, but we generate that. We have a, a utility, which is open source, by the way, it's called MPS Interop. What it does, it basically read the language definition and exports some JSON. Then we read that JSON from TypeScript and generate TypeScript classes from TypeScript because in TypeScript we have a framework to generate TypeScript code. So we just take advantage of that. For example, this is a concept of our language is called step. It has its children and properties and whatnot. We export all the stuff in JSON. And when we do so, we need to export all the information from all the libraries we are referring to, from all the libraries that are shipped with MPS so, so that we know about the definition of iname concept and we know it has a property of type name, the uh, property name, name of type string. We need all this kind of information. Eventually we get a JSON, which is sort of readable, it has uh, all the information about the concept and from TypeScript we read these and we can generate TypeScript code. Now, uh, you are not forced to use this generated class, what we call language specific APIs. You could also use directly these uh, reflective APIs that are generic and do not require uh, code generation. However, they are more error prone because of course they are dynamic. For example, this is an example of an editor that is created without using these generated support classes. We just use uh, the, the, um, the standard uh, web edit uh, kit APIs. And for example, we say that we want to edit uh, the property name or we want to access the child type. So if I do an error here, or if I change the language, I could break uh, this editor. So uh, this is why we prefer to generate classes because we can take advantage of the, ty of the fact that uh, TypeScript has a static type checking. And so when we change the language, if this causes uh, a problem in the editors, we will realize it because stuff doesn't compile. Now, this is uh, now a demo of uh, the web editor. So as a business analyst, I will typically work on one uh, centre de compétence and I will work on a set of, um, uh, of a set of problems like achat, amortissement, facteur fournisseur, offre, planification, and so on. So there are group of related activities and related object and related stuff. Let's say it's a subdomain. So in the web editor, I can open one and see the list uh, of activities, of objects, or processes, of arguments, of searches, all sorts of stuff. I cannot just see the list, but I can actually edit this stuff. So at some point, I should press on Ajouter Objet. It's a bit slow, but eventually it will create an object. And we see the new line saying my new object. I could open it, but instead delete it. So I can create and delete stuff. And then I can go and open anything that I want into uh, this web editor. 
So I'm going to open, I think, uh, Cesir Home Factor Fournisseur, if my memory helps me. And yeah, it takes a while to load. It's not that fast, but eventually it loads an activity, basically it called MPS server, it asks all the information about uh, this activity and it renders this activity. Now, suppose is the first time that I open this editor, I have no idea how to use it, but I figure out that I can just drag and drop stuff. So does it require a lot of training to use that? So I will just uh, drop these things. Now I can add uh, the name of my step. Every step must have at least one action. So I have already a placeholder that I can use to edit my action. So I can trigger auto completion. It gives me the list of things that I can refer uh, into this case. I decide to add uh, an, a, an action of type selectione. And then uh, you cannot see it because it's not in the part that I'm zooming, but I'm dragging and here dropping another action of type selectione. Now, uh, I can uh, basically add stuff or by pressing enter or by using drag and drop, but um, these are the two different modalities to edit stuff. At some point I should go, ah yeah, very important thing. I could press export XML from here so that I can generate the XML and deploy it uh, manually in some other system. Of course, in the future, we want to add a button that say deploy in a text environment because given we are already on the web, it doesn't make sense to export stuff and to manually import them in the web portal. So the next logical step is to replace this export XML with a deploy button. Now I can go and edit uh, something else. So a process. Processes are something that we are just starting to support. Basically, they represent uh, the higher level of abstraction. So a set of activities are a macro activity or a process. I can generate a diagram. It's not as cool as the one Tom shown the other day because it not update automatically. You have to click the button update. Now that I've seen the presentation from Tom, it feels outdated. So I will change that. But a nice feature this one has is that it gives you the possibility of expand the activities you are referring and get one single diagram. And by the way, you can also uh, click on the si singular activities and they will open in the editor. So this is a very quick overview of the, the, the web editor. But now that you have seen it, I want to talk about some principles. One important principle is flexibility. For example, drag and drop is not directly support by web edit kit. It's something we understood we wanted and we were able to edit it, to, to add it specifically in this project. We just uh, pick uh, a library that is called uh, uh, Dragula for drag and drop. And it took me six months to understand that Dragula stand for drag and drop. I think Sergey made me realize that. But it shows you that uh, it's really easy to extend Web Edit Kit and just reuse web libraries. In this case, uh, we just had uh, this hook, basically when uh, this uh, virtual DOM library has generated the code, we want to run an insert hook that just add a drop target so that we can drop stuff into the steps area. So it's that easy. And another principle that we want to follow is the one of combining approachability with productivity. So we want to have a gentle learning curve. So the opposite of MPS basically. Uh, we want to make it easy for people to get started. So uh, sometimes I think it's also a matter of perception. If you think that you can start with drag and drop, you have the idea that the tool is easy, so you can get started. Then eventually I think you will do more and more using 
uh, keyboard shortcut because it just makes sense. Sometimes you after a while you realize that you can just press enter, control space to select what you can enter, you will do that. But I think that first impression really matter and it makes easy to bring people on board because they can start using uh, drag and drop and later move to using the keyboard. Also, uh, the project view is not part of web edit kit, just something custom for this project. So when I went uh, in the menu and I, there was a button to add object, it just executed with this code. So we are generating this uh, uh, virtual DOM node that is a button. We specify the tooltip in this way. So we specify basically a CSS class and then what we want to show in the tooltip. And then to actually uh, execute the code, by the way, this code is a better version of the one I show in the editor because it actually asks you to insert the name instead of call it just my new object. So it prompt ask you the name and then it used this uh, facade that is called VS communication that we used to do all the web socket call. We just get this facade. Once we have it, we just call create root, specify the name of the model, the name of the concept and the properties. In TypeScript, you have this shortcut. If you want to specify an object with a property name, getting the value of a variable named name, you just type name and this uh, is what it means. So very easy to add this button. Or uh, another thing that we have is this extension mechanism. Basically, in this case, we have the logic in MPS to generate this diagram because we have also similar diagrams into MPS. So we want to reuse this logic that we have in MPS get a description of the diagram we need to, to show and then do the actual rendering using uh, this uh, JavaScript library. So we do that by using the extension mechanism and we basically can define in MPS server new action that we can expose connected to a certain object, to a certain concept, sorry, and then we can invoke this action either through WebSockets or HTTP calls. For example, in this case, we have a, an action that can also take one Boolean parameter expanded. So this flag to show the expanded or not expanded process. We get this parameter and then we invoke the logic that we have on the MPS side that calculates this, uh, the information to show in the diagram and then we serialize it and send it to a edit kit that will then draw it. And this is the same principle that we use for, to implement this export XML button. We have this logic already implemented in MPS, so we basically are doing a remote call to MPS. Now, we could potentially also expose all the action that are part of the behavior. We didn't, we decide not to do so, but to decide specifically what we want to expose and maybe define simpler interfaces. But yeah, that's uh, that's the way that you can expose stuff that are part of your behavior in MPS server so that you can access it from Web Edit Kit. Now, what is the status of the project? Right now, you can use the web editor to complement what you're doing in MPS. It doesn't have all the functionality that the MPS editors have. So uh, you want to do the complex stuff in MPS, but if you need to read the information or to do lightweight editing, you can also do that from the web editor. Uh, to build this, we also needed, of course, to do a lot of work on MPS Server and Web Edit Kit, which are open source projects available right now. And so, um, so we wanted to, to show what we have done so far and also tell you that there are these underlying technology that we hope to evolve together. Now, there are a lot of challenges. <laughs> 
with this thing. Now, the first big challenge is, of course, building usable and performant editors. And, uh, well, that's difficult. The second di difficulty is to keep MPS editors and web editors aligned. The third one is supporting collaboration, and collaboration between people using MPS and using the web editor. And finally, having MPS on the server is quite challenging. So let's dive into this. Now, building usable editors is a lot of work. MPS server, well, MPS evolved, I think, over 15 years and becomes easier and easier to use. And then there was the big contribution of grammar cells but to really get there, there is a lot of work to do. Things like site transformation, substitution, auto wrapping references are all things that you need to replicate to give the same usability into a web editor. And you need to do that, uh, making something that is fast. That's, that's hard, it's a lot of work. So maybe we should just take uh, a lot of inspiration for things like grammar cells and try to replicate some of this usability. Because at the moment, with Web Edit Kit, it's easy to represent the structural part of the languages, but expression are basically not supported. So we need to get there by using something like grammar cells, or maybe take inspiration from Projected. So if you're unfamiliar with it, this is a projectional editor that runs in the browser from Jos Warmer. It's not connected from a, uh, to MPS, so it doesn't work natively with MPS, but I think uh, is doing a great job in making web editors that are usable. So maybe we should study it and learn lessons from there. Then there are challenges in keeping alignment and alignments can be in two ways. Alignment with the concept. So I change a concept and I need to adapt the web editor in alignment with the editors that I built for usage within MPS. And I need to have uh, similar editors also on the web. So for alignment with the concept, we have seen that we have this mechanism so that we can generate basically support classes from language definitions so that we can use them in our editors. If we break some things, we realize that. So it, it really help us to at least notice a problem. Then we don't have the nice feature we have within MPS that if you rename something, it automatically rename the point in which we, you were using this thing. If I change the name of a certain property, I will change therefore the name of the generated method and it will break my editor. I will notice that. It, that, it will not compile, but I will still need to go there and change it manually. So this is something to consider. Now, alignment with MPS editors, by that I mean this. When you uh, prototype a new piece of the language, maybe you create 20 concepts, 15 of which are very small things, and five of these are very are more complex. So to see that, in the web editor, you need to replicate all these editors uh, or these 20 editors. But given 15 are very stupid because are maybe just a constant or reading a property, we have also mechanisms to read the MPS editor definition. And in case they are very simple, and only in those cases, we can automatically generate the corresponding uh, web editor definition. Now, this works if you are using an horizontal collection, a vertical collection, a property, a constant. If you have uh, logic written in base language, it doesn't work. And this is not the mechanism that we want people to use for the final web editor, just to uh, get started more quickly when you're writing web editors for a ton of concepts. Okay, there are a lot of concepts that are very stupid. They have trivial editors, so we can, in this way, avoid to writing boilerplate code. And then there is the big, big challenge of collaboration. At this moment, in which we are in an experimental phase, collaboration works in this way. You have multiple people 
opening editors in their browser using web edit kit they talk to the same instance of the mps server so they see the same stuff right so it works in this way which is not the way it should work in the future and i will talk about that in the next slides on uh, on the traditional mps side we have people using git and by the way this is the usual complaint people well, developers are okay using Git, but business analysts are not in love with Git and commit and pushing and pulling and merge conflicts. No one wants to deal with that. So one possibility that uh, could help us is using Modelix. So we could have basically the people on the MPS side using Modelix, so connect to a model server, and WebEdit could use Modelix, Modelix indirectly. So it could connect to an instance of MPS server running on an MPS that is connected to Modelix. So in this way, we could also afford having multiple instances of MPS server because they would talk to the same model, model server through Modelix. So this is uh, what uh, we could do in the future. And uh, then there is this challenge that MPS uh, running on the server, well, it's really, it's heavy. It takes a lot of resources. And so we don't know how many users we can serve, uh, how many web edit kit user we can serve with a single instance of MPS server. This is a challenge. And so it is something we need to figure out. Maybe we can serve just one. Maybe we can serve three, five, 10. I don't have numbers about that. Now, pl plans for the future. We want to build a better support for processes. We, as you've seen that part with the diagrams. We want to make the editor great for read-only support. So visualizing, navigating, exploring the stuff. Then to make great support for editing a subset of the things first so that we can have certain uh, certain uh, kind of editing activities being performed completely on the web while in parallel some others will keep being performed on traditional mps and then of course integration with modelix is uh, very important other things in more distant future are maybe ever more what you see is what you get approach because at the moment, basically, we define activities that there are from which then we generate web application. If we could have a more clear mapping between the things we define and how the application will look like, that could help. We, of course, want to be able to preview activities directly in the browser while we are editing them. It will really reduce the feedback cycle, which I think is a key aspect of uh, using DSL. And uh, we could uh, take advantage of the fact that we have an interpreter running in the browser while we are editing in the browser to have a sort of online debugger. So I think that's also very interesting. Not something we can do tomorrow, but for the future is a very interesting possibility. And yeah, that was it. So if you have questions, uh, we'll be happy to answer them. All right. Um, I'm not sure if you uh, asked me specifically if I have questions, but I certainly have several. So, <laughs> well, so in general, but I'm happy <laughs> to answer yours specifically. I know. <laughs> so let's first start uh, with the question by Antonio. Uh, is there a tutorial or guideline how to create RCP versions of MPS? It's kind of not related to the web stuff, but I'm sure you have an answer. Um, no, I would probably say that there are videos in the heavy meta series from Colia mm -hmm. that are, uh, at least for what I know, they are the best resource because I think building an RCP is 99% uh, of the problem is making the build run. And then you can customize a few things. Yeah. You can use the embedder platform to remove actions from the menus. You can use the embedder platform to create your own custom project views. 
And so, but that part to me seems easier than get the build running. <laughs> For that, I think there is this screen share from Colia that was four hours long. <laughs> <laughs> they give you an idea <laughs> of the complexity. Yeah, I, I was yesterday when, or today before yesterday, when Tom was showing this yeoman thing. Um, I I think it would be very nice if there were contributions by the community um, that help you, you know, to basically give you this project setup wizard kind of thing that includes generating various infrastructure things like build files, you know, the, the, the build server integration, all of this. Um, I have a prototype uh, Gradle uh, plugin that is called MPS Wizard. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have the stuff with the build, but you can write three lines and say, please give me a project with yeah. kernel F and the embedder platform. Stuff <laughs> and like it that. downloads MPS like we typically do with the uh, plugins, uh, you know. So it, it gives you some of the stuff, but it doesn't do the build the module yeah, yeah. as Tom did. So we need to steal it. Uh, well, sorry, uh, we have take inspiration from that. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but um, I, I discussed, we discussed this yesterday a little bit in the Etermis internal channel and uh, Kolya pointed out that one problem of um, automatically creating such projects is that you have to take care that the unique IDs of the various things are actually unique. Otherwise you have lots of projects flying around the planet, which all have the same unique IDs, which is not good. Um, and doing this consistently is easiest done through the S model APIs, but those are not available outside of MPS. And so you'd have to launch an MPS and all to run the wizard and uh, look, it becomes complicated. So, uh, but I think it's in a way, I'll, maybe the same problem you have in Modelix then, because in Modelix, if you have defined a model, you are generating the ID and then you're forcing them mm. into MPS. So I if you were were running. <laughs> I think the point of Kolya was you can't just take an example project, copy it over, and ah, yeah. uh, add a bunch of name changes. You have to deal with the IDs as well, right? So there's 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 more to that than just simply copying a template and changing three names. Yeah, so you need complex APIs to see, okay, I'm changing this node with this other ID and then I yeah. need to update all the references. Yeah, and exactly. Then... It has to be consistent. You have to import. I don't know the details, but Kolya played around with this and it's supposedly not that easy. But but anyway, it would be interesting to have that. Okay. If it's a problem from Kolya, then I think it's a problem for all of us. Yeah. Right. So um, obviously, I, I when you were demoing Web Edit Kit, first of all, I, I was aware that it exists, but I didn't know how cool it is, so I was <laughs> surprised. Uh, second, um, obviously, I had questions regarding integration with Modelix because it's kind of obvious, but then you addressed some of that stuff. Um, and you pointed out that um, um, running MPS on the server is a challenge. Um, I see why, but I would su suspect that Sasha probably solved that, right? It, I mean, not the resource consumptions, but getting it running, making sure there is scalability, automatically starting MPS instances, doing the health check, killing them if they get if they die, stuff like that. I think he has solved it in the sense that, uh, given it, if when you use Modelix, basically MPS becomes stateless. And then you yeah. can uh, scale in that way. Yes, yes. So we definitely need that. Yeah. No, but I mean, what I'm trying to say is that you probably don't want to build this again. You really want to use Modelix. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I want to use Modelix. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I, actually, I think that if, if we see Modelix more as the backend infrastructure, um, with APIs onto which people, for example, you can build editor, uh, web editor kits like yours, then I think the, 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 the overall story looks quite, quite promising. Yes, yes. No, I'm uh, convinced uh, to, to use Modelix. I'm also contributing to it. So yeah, I, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> I, I'm convinced. Yeah, no, no, I, I know that you're convinced. I'm not trying to convince you. I'm trying to paint the picture for the audience where this whole story could go. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I think that integration, I think we, as a community, we are growing 
and we are increasing our resources, but we are also very small still. So if we can collaborate and build common building block, I think uh, it's really vital for this community. Yeah. Also, uh, just to make a little bit of an advertisement for Modelix, um, one thing we learned from the not quite successful internal, ATM's internal convecton thing was to see Modelix much more as a platform. And both technically, in the sense that it is technically possible to plug in different editors, projectional editors, graphical editors, maybe even parser-based editors. Uh, you can plug in different services in the backend, type checkers, of course, obviously, but also, uh, I don't know, model checkers, as in model checking algorithm and stuff like that. But also in terms of the project setup, where ideally there is one jointly developed thing that is the backend infrastructure that deals with collaboration, storage, the service API and so on, but then different people in the community can contribute editing frameworks or notation definition infrastructures, right? Or various services. And this is a much more open um, view of the world than both MPS and also Convecton was. So, yes. So there's a question to me in the chat uh, by Meinte. Is it Temis's TypeScript implementation as going in MPS going to be public at some point? I really don't know um, for two reasons. One, I don't know what the state of this thing is. Is it like 30% of TypeScript or 80%? I just don't know. Uh, maybe if Sasha is in the chat, he can he can answer that. He should he should know. Um, the second thing is. Um, at this point, I am unable to make generalized statements about Itemis's uh, intent of open sourcing stuff. Let's put it this way. All right. There are no more questions, uh, Federico. The, uh, Noli said that there are no, no more questions because people are um, uh, blown away by your stuff. And um, so people are still processing. I don't know where to start. Thank you. Okay. Of course, I recorded the demo, so you saw all the bits that work. There are a yes. very <laughs> subset of, of the whole picture. But uh, well, this, just, this just demonstrates that you're an experienced consultant and, and demo <laughs> person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but I want to stress that these expression things, you know, is probably is going to be a challenge and uh, usability is challenging. But I think that things like MPS server is instead easier and you could use it independently for doing things like, uh, okay, I want to have a service that maybe generates some visualization and you, yeah, it's, I mean, the idea is just you do an HTTP call. It's not like it's rocket science. Why web edit kit is more challenging. Yeah. So it is rocket science. Yeah, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> or for me, it's rocket science. Maybe yeah. for Sasha, is a yeah, couple yeah, of clicks. Yeah. And... Yeah, of course. So, but uh, closing words here, what I'm really happy about is that two years ago, on during the first MPS meetup, or maybe it was three years, we were all saying, well, man, shit, we need to somehow get into the web. And we really didn't have lots of an, a lot of an answer, uh, a, lot, an, a real answer. But um, I think we're getting there slowly from various places probably needs to be more coordination uh, which is starting to happen but i'm really glad to to see this trend so that's that's really mm -hmm. nice and uh, i think uh, maybe i think also that uh, one thing that uh, one was afraid to invest too much in building something for the web is the fact that also JetBrains is working on a solution so the yeah. fact that say that it will take a couple of years before there it's public, at least, makes <laughs> more space for <laughs> hotel activities, right? <laughs> right? Absolutely, yeah. All right, so Federico, thank you very much, as usual. Thanks.